This video is brought to you by JohnTorelli.com, the place to go to get in shape and stay that way. There's a free trial available with no credit card required. JohnTorelli.com To introduce this gentleman, his name is Billy Knight. We're very close friends, basically brothers, and you know we're going to use a lot of the terms that we use when we talk to each other today because we have nothing to hide. Billy, what do you think has been lost in modern bodybuilding? What's happening today? Whew. What's happening today, I think, is because of the guidance by the Wheeler brothers. See, since they both passed on, there's been a lot of confusion. There's no leadership, so there's no direction. Now you got an IBB going three different ways, the physiques with the belly sticking out. You know, everyone, you know, they stand like Tarzan for the cemetery round. They don't just chill, you know, do it properly the way Bill Pearl put it together when he put the, the judging criteria together. You know, they come on stage and the hand is like this man. I'm thinking, you know, hey, just settle down. But you tell them to settle down, they do it because, do it to please you. But when they come to the contest- They do it again. They, all of them doing it, John, all. Billy, you know what I found, how we used to go through our posing. Yeah. Which, you know, Vince Basile was a big influence. You were a big influence. Robert Nalen was a big influence. You passed on to me what Robert taught you. Then I, I did photos with Robert and, you know, I learned a lot from, posing on those rocks where he also photographed Arnold and all the other greats. Um, these days, there's these posing workshops. And what I notice is when people go to those, they, I, I'm not pleased with what they get taught. I stopped going to those posing clinics because I did realize, hey, I'm coming here and I'm preaching something and everybody else is going in another direction. And whenever I teach anybody to pose and they go to the posing workshop, they come back doing what you just described. So yeah. they go there yeah. to actually become worse from what I can see. Yeah. So I stopped doing posing workshops because it was only one person doing it one way and everybody else is doing something that I totally disagree with, which I think is ruining the sport. So when people come to me for posing, I don't teach them what they get taught at the posing workshop. I continue on with what... I learned, which you helped me refine. And there's a whole history there from Vince Basile to Robert Nalon to you, um, some of the people that you hung around with and uh, you know, I, I got to meet as well. So there's a whole history there of something that I practice, which no longer, I, I, you know, so when people come to me for posing, I, I I, I do totally different to what happens in those workshops. Yep. Do you do you think it's just the posing these days, or or, or, or the, the way the bodies are looking? Because I, I think it's both. And what you mentioned, nobody else talks about. Ever since the Weirder Brothers passed on, things just seem to be going in the wrong direction. I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure how hard people are trying who are at the top, you know, the, the heads of these federations, like you said, there's two IFBBs now, there's two IFBB federations, and then they both call themselves IFBB. It's so confusing. Well, IFBB, then you've got NPC, then PCC, then DDD, and it's, it's, you know, now going back to the leadership, you see, the way I saw it back then is Bill Pearl was the head judge for IFBB. He played a very big part in formulating the, uh, the poses. And the, and the people that he prepared, like Chris Dickerson, you see, posing is very basic. Either you pose with a T, or you pose in a Y, or you pose with an S. Frank Zane does an S. Okay, Arnold does a straight, straight out T from the front, from the back, from the side. But what you got to ask yourself for these clinics. You know, how can people teach people when they don't even know how to do it themselves? Exactly. This is exactly what I mean. Most of the people okay. that are teaching you have never yeah. even stepped on stage. And if they have, no. 
if they have these days, you've you got, you got to understand some, some divisions and some federations don't even teach, they don't let you do a third round. No. You're just standing there and moving in a four quarter yeah. angles. Yeah. And that's hard enough on its own, let alone formulating uh, opposing routine, which I think is, is really important because it's not just opposing, that's conditioning. Yeah. That, that posing, that flexing, that squeezing, all the different uh, maneuvers and, and the way you're moving around, th yeah. that's conditioning. And, and if nothing it, else, it, it, is. it is. Even it people is. that don't, I've got some people that are not allowed to do a posing routine, but I actually teach them to do a posing routine because whatever they're going to do on stage, that posing routine will condition them like nothing else. Yes. Yes, I agree. Because of the flexing and the yes. turning. Yeah. And the other thing is too is they don't choose poses that complement their physique. Everyone is different. See, what I do if I'm going to help somebody, I break four poses down in three. So you got a four, a four, a four, and a four, and a four. And I said, okay, you group them in one, two, three. When I say two, one, three, they start posing the routine from the middle. If I say three, two, one, they start the routine from the back and you can spin it. So that way you can, regardless of where you start, you will end up in the same place. Okay. Uh, and then, and then once you do that, once you decide which style suits them, either it's the Y, the T or the S. Okay. And, and as I see this, it, there's a combination of a lot of things. And when you go to the contest and you've got a head judge who's calling the shots, you know, like if you've got 10 people and six people are turning left and six, four people are turning right, how can you judge them when it's not on the same angle? You know? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's gone from bad to worse, John. Bad to worse. But the uh, only thing I can say is, you know, I don't know what's going to fix it. What I do know that's so crazy now is the amount of money that they charge. Oh man, they're ripping people off left, right, and center. Well, Billy, the promoters are making a lot of money because now with all the different federations and all the different categories, yeah, you, you do realize when people enter a category, they've got to pay the promoter yeah. for each category that they enter. Yeah. So they're no longer caring how many people come into the audience no. because they're not making their money from the audience. No, they do, I'm sure they make money from the audience, but where they're making their money from is the actual competitor. So if you have 200 competitors that have chosen to do two divisions each, do you realize how much money the promoter makes? Yep. You know, I'm, I, I think I'm in the wrong game. I, I actually think, I mean, we've, we've spoken about this. We've tried to help other federations. We, you, you and I have spoken with the heads of federations. You know that, okay? Yeah. You, and you remember yeah. it, it was that Sunday night. Yet, I, I, I don't think we got anywhere. I, I'm, you know, I know you're out there, you'll, you'll practically help anyone who wants to move forward. So, um, I, I'm not sure whether there's whether whether another another federation is needed, which does a little bit more stable things that are better for the athletes and are better for the audience, or just to continue down the same road um, and try to show more quality in everything that you do. But I, I I can certainly start to see that running a federation is a good way to make money. There's a lot of money there if you do it yeah. properly, John. If it's done correctly, that, there yeah. is a lot of money. There is a lot yeah. of money. Now, what I wanted to know from you is, you got to a point where you kind of drifted away from competition or you drifted away from that focus that we had in 1980, where we, we were going to take over the world. Yeah. Okay. You <clears throat> started going sideways. You started becoming an official in different federations. Why did you never turn pro? Why did you not go to that next level? Have we already discussed this? Have you given us a hint or did you want to address that now? You see, I was the IBB star, superstar 
in my time, 80, 81, 82. Paul Graham and, and Carol took really, really good care of me. And I think you were in that mold as well. But what I did was I tried to be smart by creating a bodybuilding union to represent the bodybuilders. And that was the mistake that I made because the bodybuilders don't even know what they want. How can you help people who don't want to be helped? Okay, so we split. We did the UBBA. I went in as president for five years. I was international vice president for NABA, international vice president for WABA. I took all those positions. And at one stage in Austria, in Graz in Austria, uh, Oscar Heidenstein pulled me aside and asked me if I could take over the presidency. Okay, and I says, I, I, I got to sleep on this. So the next morning I, I decided no, because I've only just become president of Australia and I want to help Australia reach a level that's never reached before. And at that time we start to pull through. That's when all the boys started winning and the girls started winning, you know what I'm saying? So, so, and anyway, so it was, at the time, it worked out that for me to be successful as an athlete, I needed 80% of my time to focus on that. When I left that and I went the other way, it was also because of my family. My kids were young, you know, they were three, six, and nine, and I, I needed to spend more time to, to get them the best out of them. And that's what happened. There was a big gap. And I went coaching soccer, I went coaching rugby, I went coaching netball and all that, you know, and got good results, very, very, very good results, because the principles were the same until much later, where I sat them down and they said, you know, I, I feel like competing again, and, and I, I want to uh, move the other way. And that's when I came back after 29 years and competed, you know, again, just searching, they're trying to prove to me proof that there's something that if I need to do, I got to stop talking about it and just get down and do it. You know, um, I don't know, again, combination of a lot of different things. And then I got into a business uh, uh, situation where I'm still doing now and, and uh, I'm happy about it. And just not getting the results that I need to get, but it's gonna the things take time. So, so what have you been doing ever since you retired? Well, for me to say nothing, it's unfair. I, I, uh, I do a lot of correspondence on the computer. Uh, I get two, two phases of information fed to me uh, worldwide, uh, 8.30 in the morning and 3.30 in the afternoon. And I get, you know, between two e emails to 12 emails. So basically the way I see it is I'm just trying to connect all the pieces of this jigsaw puzzle to get the results of what I'm looking for or what I'm trying to achieve. Now, once that comes out, whether it's going to be black or white, black and white, then I got to try and put colors into it that'll suit that particular picture that I'm trying to paint to suit what I'm waiting on as well. Billy, uh... Another question, how would you start a federation and run contests today? Could you how give, do us I, some, do I, give, give me a summary on what you think about that question and how you would do it today. You see, when you look back or when I look back at uh, the, the proper way to do it, there's no proper way, you know? it boils down after this experience just recently that there was a reason why Paul did what he did because you can't satisfy everybody. Everybody's going to try and rip you off. Everybody's going to try and stab you in the back. You just go in, put your head down, do what you got to do. And that's it. And if you want to include other States, you go on the format of, of, of uh, finding promoters. The promoters want to promote your show. They pay a levy, they run the show the best way they want to run the show under the guidelines 
and rules and regulations of the international figure. Because what you do in Australia, when you send your champs, you're going, in this case, with NAVA, we're sending them to NAVA. So we're going to try and do the same code of rules and regulations that NAVA is doing internationally. But at the moment, it isn't like that. Now, we well, were talking can about... Can I ask you something? We, we, we had a long conversation. Um, I, you know, the NABA presidency was up for grabs. Um, they made it look like Lee Priest was a president when he actually wasn't. It was Tom Massey. And Tom Massey is the president now. I'm not sure what they're using Lee Priest for. Um, Eddie Elwood is the president. He took it away from Graham Lansfield. But I've not seen any, any NABA universe for the last two years. What is all that about? Because other federations have been running. There's other, there's other federations in England, the IBF, the IBFA, which um, Martin Yates runs. There's, there's contests being held in Italy. There's other contests being held in the United Kingdom. What's happened to the NABA universe? Because at one stage, I thought it should be moved to Australia. Um, they didn't want any part of that because of some sort of heritage thing going on with it. It's got to be kept in England. But the fact is, there's been no contest. Now, a prestigious contest like the NABA Universe just goes missing for the last two years. What's, what's all that about? When's it going to start again? Is I, it, think is with, it start? I think with the COVID, every country has different ruling. So to get commitments from different countries to attend the universe, that w could have been part of the problem. You see, you can't run a show without the athletes. So unless you get the, the approval of the federations from each country that they're going to send the athletes. See, we couldn't send any athletes. They wouldn't allow us to go out of the country. They wouldn't allow us to come back into the country. So there's a lot of confusion, a lot of confusion. So we've got to be very, very careful. You know, there's a chance the universe could happen this year, but there's no guarantee because it changes on a daily basis. One minute you get the council's approval, the next minute the government's approval, the next minute, you know, they, they got the mask and then another thing, it's something else, it's something else. Well, well, there's other federations like the IBFA, which are going really strong. So that's in the same country, it's England. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, again, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not very familiar with that. What I'm also saying is that there are, there are people that want to take that risk to do it in this case and hope that the athletes come and hope that the, the audience will show up for them to recover the expenses. But, but if you don't have the sponsorships who don't want to get the sponsorships, the sponsors that don't want to get involved with shows, not knowing you're going to have it or not, it's, it's hard as well because there's no commitment. You can't commit. And, and that's one of the problems I think we had. One minute we had the sponsors, next minute they pull out. The one minute we had the venue, the next thing we couldn't have the venue. It was restricted from 500 to 200 or 100. So when you add up all the numbers, it doesn't work out. And if you, nobody wants to go into a situation on a loss before they start. Sure. You know? Yeah. No, so, it's just that I've seen, I've seen other federations run and do well yeah. in the United Kingdom. So yeah. I'm not sure who makes these decisions for NABA. Yeah. In the end, who's you know who's in charge and who lets anything happen at all? I'm yeah. I'm really not sure. I know that Eddie Elwood is the, is the president, but he's also got his own business and family, and you know he's busy with a lot of stuff. Yeah. And you know probably what used to be the most prestigious contest when Bill Pearl was winning it and Arnold was winning it is now just disappeared. So we've got two IFBBs, we've got Graham Lansfield with his WFF, we've got the IBFA, and uh, what's the other one that Ian Harrison's run? He and Ian Harrison runs, that's uh, yeah. the PCA. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody's all over the place. How do we get the audience back? That's a hard one, again, because of this pandemic. You know, there's still no clear picture on what to, to really understand what we've come out of and where we're going. 
you know, now they're saying there's the new variants coming, the monkeypox or chickenpox and all sorts yeah. of stuff. They're scaring shit out of people. Yeah. They don't, they don't want to die. They don't want to train as hard. They don't want to commit themselves to, uh, uh, to a contest. You know, we're trying as hard as we can to run a contest, and that's hard because everybody who comes on board wants to take over. That even, makes it even harder. B Billy, there's a person in Italy called Biagio Filozzola. Yeah. He yeah. is doing quite well and he runs outdoor contests outdoors. Yes. That's yes. a good idea. I, I, you know, I once suggested that, you know, just imagine having a big contest in Australia outdoors, yeah. Bondi Beach. Um, we were losing the audiences before COVID, Billy. COVID, yeah. COVID is really an excuse for everybody who wanted to fail or wanted to pull out. They've used COVID as an excuse, and I'm getting a little bit sick of it because uh, some of the things that I started seeing people do when COVID first came on the scene, I'm going, this is reprehensible behavior. They, yeah. they can't be doing this. And they had to reverse these policies. I'm not going to get into any discussions about that, but I've seen it. It's obvious. Yep. So we were losing this audience, all our audiences before COVID. So let's let's not use COVID as an excuse, because like I said, some federations are doing fine. The 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 NPC and IFBB in the United States and all around the world are doing fine. Yep. They're getting their audiences in the Mr. Olympia. They've got their sponsors, and it's the same game. So this was happening way before COVID. I so agree. What, what, what do you think, other than COVID now as an excuse, is it all about? What's going on? Why is this happening? I just still feel that the confusion is still out there. They don't want to commit on certain shows or they don't want to commit. Who are we to... talking about now? We're talking, you're, uh, you're talking about NABBA. Well, I'm talking about all of them in general, there's far too many of them anyway. So what works for NABBA may not work for IBB. What works for IBB may not work for NABBA. It's all different. You know, NABBA has shows in, on the Gold Coast, quite successful. But, you know, like what you said, they don't do one category. They do two categories. They do three categories. They do four categories. And that's where they make their money as well. Because to every category you go in is $150. Or two hundred dollars or something. I don't know. Then you got your membership. It's another two hundred dollars. And then you got your wife and your kids. At Fifty dollars a head or one hundred twenty dollars a head. My oh, man, it's it's like a couple of grand. You got to outlay it to go and do. You know, it's I don't know, man. It, it's 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 hard. It's harder than hard. Look, but, I I agree with you because I've seen some people um, that used to have a, a, a certain logic about how bodybuilding should be run and what they would like to see and what was getting in the way and on and on. Then they become promoters and yeah. they start making money. And all of a sudden that philosophy changes. And, you know, th these were people who... But Ar Arnold, I've got to give it to Arnold. He runs shows and he will come out and voice and say what he doesn't like about the open class. Yeah. Other people who have just gotten involved as promoters, they're like, oh, well, you know, we now have a new class that's all about size and we've got uh, this other class which shows all the classic lines and everything. Uh, you know, to, to me, it can be done better. Yes, definitely, I, I agree. You know, if you look at classes, how many classes do they now have for ladies? I've lost count. I think there's, um, <laughs> there's, there's fitness, then there's bikini, uh, then there's figure, women's physique, and women's open. So that's five right there. But there's more. I'm sure there's more. Yeah, there's modeling and there's this and that. I don't know, but but people enjoy doing that. You know, yeah, it's not I mean, body. When, when it's was the last time you were able to go to a show and actually watch it? When I go to a show now, I cannot last until the women come out. Usually, the women come out last. Yeah. And I'm so burnt out from watching all the classes, let, let alone when I'm judging. 
when I'm judging, I don't even know how the judges make it through a whole day of judging. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm totally lost. I, I don't even know what's going on out there because number one, I, I, I'm not even sure what shows I should go and watch. And when I go, I, I, I can't last the, the, the way things are done. I, I don't get to see everything that's there because it's just overbearing. Yeah. But I think what happens is that the audience shuffles in and out. When your division comes on, your family may have been there all day or they, they're trying to time it to get there when you're on stage. So it's a little bit difficult for the audience, but the promoters sure are making money and it sure is enticing when I see the amount of money that they're making and you know how they're making it. So I, I, I don't blame them and I, I feel like jumping in and doing the same because it's good, you know, people are voluntarily, they're voluntarily doing this, you know, and, and you're yeah. providing a platform for them to do it. No, true, true. See, there's so many different areas in it that you could try and fix, but it's going to be difficult. See, one of the things is the numbers. They've got categories with only one athlete. In our time, if, if there's three people in one category, you can have it. If there's two or one, you squash it. You put them in somewhere else. But now you, you go into a category, they create a new category for you, and you're the only competitor there. So you get a gold medal, big, nice big gold medal. And then you come out two categories later, same person, you know, with someone else beside them. And he wins another big medal. So I don't know, is it the trophies are they after or the plastic medals? I don't know. But there's no strict ruling. You know, like in my time, right, in my time when I say the mid 80s, if you run a national contest, you got to have at least four states represented into it. But back in the early 80s, 79, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, we had competitors and officials from every state. So go back to the judging. We had nine judges, and every judge represented their state, different states. But now it's different. You know, you can look at the judges and there's four out of the nine judges come from the same gym. So where do they place oh, the, the athletes that go in the same gym? So, you know, all these things and people complain, they get thrown out. So, you know, the cycle changes all. I don't know. I'm blind, but it's no, I mean, been... look, I've, I've even um, seen some athletes enter, enter certain federations and when they had a particular head judge. Yeah. Um, I, I was actually liking the accuracy of the judging and then all of a sudden that head judge left and you know somebody's going into this contest to try and win a pro card that that head judge leaves and all of a sudden it, you know something that supposed to be a pro card to represent Australia turns into a Mr Melbourne contest and you, you know you're competing in Melbourne for a pro card but you can actually see favoritism for all the Melbourne bodybuilders. Yeah. If somebody yeah. from Sydney comes along, they, if, even if they were good enough to represent, uh, no the show, country, they, they don't get, they don't even get a look at it. And it's like, we'll just put him to one side because we've got all these people here from Melbourne. Yep. I've seen this. This is not my imagination. And I've no, seen a change no. because a couple of years ago when there was a different head judge, it was much more accurate. Yeah. So you, you have the two IFBBs now, okay? They, they both um, have pro categories. One may have one or two shows in the United States. Another one has the majority of their shows in the United States. Um, I, I just wish that one of them would change their name. If one of them would change their name, I think there would be less confusion and it would be better for everybody across the board. What do you think? It's hard because everyone is trying to f solve this problem. But you're going into this space. If they're making good money with the contacts that they have, with the sponsors that they have, they don't care what you say, what you think, Mambra. Now, either, either you're with them or you're not with them. You're not with them. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So should judging be changed?
it's going to be hard because everyone is, doesn't know what direction to take and they're, they're copying each other and the confusion gets worse you know even from the, the start when you walk out you know one of the things bill Pearl say never look down it shows that you, you you're not prepared to be there you you're not sure that you should be there or not when you do your quarter turns it's the same same spin quarter turn to the right right quarter turn to the right right quarter turn to the right you can't quarter turn to the right three and got to turn the other way, got to turn to the left, and it's all confused. It tangles up, man. There's no consistency in your judging. And the head judge just sitting there. He doesn't even know what day it is himself. So that makes it even worse. You know, so, they, they've, tried, they've tried so many different things. New federations, more money, but no, no guidance. Like I said, when the brothers left us, it made things worse. We went from bad to worse now. And the, and, and the way I see it is what Paul has been doing. You get promoters, they pay their levy, they run the show, let them run it. In the code and directions or regulations for the future. Now you say, I ask you, what are the benefits of a pro card? Everyone but wants to get a program, and then what? And then what? What have they done yeah. in the last five years as a pro well, card? They, they usually get a pro card, and that's where it ends. They don't even. They don't even. But it didn't even. It didn't even start. How can you end something that never started? And that's that's that is a, a big problem. Everyone's walking around with, "I have a pro card." What we do? And they have a pro card, but never competed in a pro show. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, back in the uh, days, PBBI was a professional uh, association. Now, were they pros? Well, they got paid money. Yeah, was it? That's, that makes them a pro. Yep. And but some, they... some good competitors did compete in there, like Roger Walker, who was yes, already professional yes. and... Sonny Graham, Smith, Graham Lansfield, Sonny Schmidt. They, yep. But um, but they came back into the amateur and competed against the young fellows who was trying to get a break. They already turned pro. They've already yep. taken all that money. And same thing now. You got a pro card, but what what show that you compete in to win money in Australia? I don't think there's any. No, there's none. Thank you. So only, this is only have two choices, one IFBBA or IFBBB, but you've got to go to America to get an opportunity. And all the judges are Americans, and you're from Australia, there's no Australian judge to give no, you an edge. Both IFBBs do run shows in Europe, uh, but with the war in the Ukraine and what's going on in Europe, I'm not sure that how people feel about traveling there. I'm a United States guy. I like to go to the United States. I like to see shows in the United States. I know where everything is in the United States and I know how to get around the United States. So for me, the United States is still the best place. I was told by Bill Pearl much earlier when I first met him and he said, Billy, this country is so big. There's so many people in this country that if you bought something for 10 cents and sold it for 11 cents, and tapped into less than 1% of the population, you're a billionaire, Billy. Yeah. Who said that to you? Bill Pearl. Bill Pearl, yeah. Yeah. So regardless of where you have the show, what federation you have the show, it's going to be full. In Australia, it's a little bit different, more political. Oh, no, I can't compete in the show. Why not? Because I'm IFPV. Okay. And the next thing you see him come over and he said, hey, brother, what happened? He said, no, those guys are crooks. They take all my money and the bloody judges are no good. You know, they, they placed me third when I should have come first. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone's an expert because they've been fed by different opinions. That's why I said it, it's very hard to find someone who's constructive in the criticism to be honest with you up front. Don't lie to the poor fella. 
But man, the other spin now is, like I said before, you've got to prep for 20 weeks on a personal trainer, for 16 weeks, for 12 weeks, for eight weeks, for six weeks. It's all different. There's no consistency. Then you've got your clinic for posing. People are teaching you how to pose, people to how to pose when they don't even know how to pose themselves. No, that says a lot. People teaching you how to My pose. My man, who, you who can never walk in. Been on you, stage, they've never actually done it, but they've taught no, others. I've joined a new gym here, World Gym, Springfield. Okay, and in the six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks I've been there, I only see two people using the superior angle, the quarter moon turn. And I approach this young boy, you know, like, like your, your dumbbell rowing. Everyone do on the bench, up and down, up and down. They never do forward pull, stretch back, you know. Mike Christian showed me that, Bertel Fox showed me that, Bill Pearl showed me that, the same, quarter moon, quarter turn, I mean, quarter moon angle. And I approached him, I said, you know, blood, that's awesome. And he said, what's that? I said, we learned to do that. He said, oh, this other guy that he's training with, he's got a pro card, IBB. And then I saw him doing squats and reminded me of Tom Platt. He's angled, you know, as he went down, his body was straight. He pushed up, pushed up straight, but his drive was almost perfect. He went down and whoop, went down, whoop. And he was able to handle four plates, okay? But well, there's not much weight, but he did 12 reps, man. Now, see, you don't see that. All the other guys come and do it, and then they're falling over. They, nearly, they never used the safety bar. Oh, man. And all the, you know, instructors walking around. They don't help anybody who's not a, a client. And it's sad, bro. It, 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 it is, but it, that, that's all that's available these days. They're not used to what we were used to, so they won't complain the way we will, Billy. Um, Billy, uh, I wanted to ask you what next? What are you going to be doing next? What's coming up next in your life? My life, my brother, my life's sitting in a place now that if it gets any better, they'll send me to heaven. But the difference is, you see, Jesus Christ is a good friend of mine. And he's saying, Billy, I don't want you up here yet. You're on a mission. Believe in what your the mission is, and I'll be there for you. Praise the Lord. Um, Billy, is there anybody that you wanted to thank? Your family, uh, a gym, a coach, anything you wanted to finish off with? I have a list of people. I have a list of people, not a very long list, but I am about helping people. And I go back to the 80%, 20%. At the moment, it's all my family, 80% with my grandkids. I got seven grandkids and that's my focus. We do boxing, we do weight training, we do soccer, we do touch everything for them. But in the back of my mind, is there's a lot of help needed for those who don't have the basic things in life. And uh, I, I, I am seriously uh, waiting to get involved with humanitarian aid projects, especially for Fiji. They got nothing, my brother. You know, when you walk into the house, the tin shack and it's raining and it's dripping and you know, when the flood comes and the tsunami comes and we don't realize how lucky we are till you experience something like that. And I've experienced that. And when I came back from Fiji, I left everything, everything. You know, I was in tears. And I continued to, do, to, to help people in Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands and Fiji. And that's my priority. Because when you ask yourself, what do you really need? Not what you want, but what need, needs do you have, the basic needs. You just need shelter, you know, to be comfortable, safety, and then with your food. And that's it, bro. You don't need to be driving 
you know, a hundred thousand dollar car. You don't need to live in a two million dollar house. But some people believe that they deserve to get that. Well, that's all right. But the, it, you haven't seen anything yet, bro. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm telling you because you know me. I, I I persist. I persevere, bro. I stretch slowly, slowly. I push. I push, and totally focus. It's like if she stands in front of me in the gym. I'm I'm, not, I'm looking, but I'm not seeing. See all these little things I put together, and it, and it works. And it works. You know, if I go into a gym and someone's doing something wrong, I'll I'll offer to help. And you can tell by the vibe if they think, oh, who's this dickhead? You know, you, you, you feel it out straight away. Anyway, back to this new gym. You know, 99.9% .9 of people, they're just walking around, bro. It's, it's sad, but it isn't because they don't know any better. And the people who are supposed to be teaching them don't know any better. Trying to teach something that they don't even understand themselves. In this case with the posing, trying to show people how to pose when you can't even pose. You don't even know what a Y pose is or a T pose or an S pose. They're the basic fundamentals of, of, of a posing routine. You know, beautiful. When, 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 when Bill Pearl hugged me in 83, he says, go, go, my, my son. He said, if you're on stage and you make a mistake in your posing, just smile because no one will know you made a mistake except you and me. And I'll be here, and I know you won't make a mistake. The first time he saw me pose, John, he said he got goosebumps. And he was talking to John Belly, and he said, Belly, you've got to see this kid, you know, from Fiji. And just trying to explain where Fiji is, and he's easy with me. I've never seen anyone as graceful with his transitions in his posing like this boy. And he saw something that, well, I, I, you know, I took advantage of it. Which you passed on to me. Yeah, but see, what you did, you spin it in a different way, that they made a trophy on you, right? What you did, you did a pose for that trophy. It was a combination of an S from the, the bottom up with a twist. No one else did that pose till today. No one would use that pose because they won't look good in that pose, John. That pose complemented your physique. It's as if you, you rip you in, in half, you know, separate your upper body from your lower body. Then you can try and explain what, it, what the pose is. But when you put it together, it's a signature pose. No one else has done that. No, honestly, have you seen anyone else done that no, pose? No. No. And it's a bit like Bill Pearl, you know, when he, he puts his hand like this. I try to do that in my routine. It looks all right, but not, different not physique. Yeah. It's a different physique. You know, and then you've got the Sergio Oliver pose with his hands up. Lee Trish does that, but the, the spread on the left don't come out like Sergio because everything just goes up and reach for the sky. You know what I'm saying? What I did want to cover was all the things that you've won, all the contests that you've won, when we met each other, which actually um, was backstage at the 1979 Pro-Am Mr. South Pacific, which we both competed in. You were the Fijian boxing champion before you came to bodybuilding. Once you got involved in bodybuilding, I don't know what it was that um, drew us towards each other. I, I saw you backstage burning yourself out and I actually, you were in a different division. And I actually came up and said something because I could tell this guy's never done this before. And, um, or you, you, may, you may have uh, had more experience than what I thought you did, but we were in a different division. We were competing in the same contest. Then we ended up working in the same gym and I don't know what you saw that I did in my training but then you kind of like wanted to train with me and I was very happy to train with you we we did it for years and that's when we really took the step to the next level where you won three national titles uh 
what people don't realize when you came on the scene, we were in the middle of the size era back then. We had Roger Walker, who was dominating everything at 260 pounds. So we had the mass monsters back then. Then you came along, uh, Roger turned professional, you came along and you actually took shape, symmetry and proportions back into the limelight because that's what you had and you were beating all the bigger guys. And I went to the United States and you know we separated and continued. Then you got involved in running federations and uh, being involved in a different side of the sport and then you kept competing. Uh, I think your last contest was a few years ago, a few years back and the last time I saw you, you visited me in Sydney where we didn't have a lot of time, it was a quick catch up. Okay, the first ever contest that I won was a junior Mr. Fiji in 1970. I was still at uh, boarding school training a bit of weights for, uh, for rugby and then I, I got into boxing had two fights against the current champ being my first fight and they put me up against the current champ uh, he beat me on points and the former champ was my second fight he beat me on points and at that time uh, a Fijian cousin of mine Albert Corvo was training Tony Mundine for the world title fight with Carlos Monzon on middleweight uh, world title so <coughs> Excuse they, me. they needed a uh, uh, extra guys to, uh, to spar Tony, so they brought uh, some cover to Dad and asked Dad if uh, if uh, he can allow me to come to Sydney to come and train boxing. So I came to Sydney, trained boxing. Uh, seven fights later, I beat the junior middleweight. Uh, we had some TV fights. Then the rating that year, I was rated number six at Fort Shane Patrick, junior middleweight uh, champion of Australia. I beat him on points. We supposed to have a rematch. That was the last fight he had and the last fight I had. Because by then I got my papers and, bought, and the boxing is a hard game. So the third week of uh, January, 1978, I think, yeah, 78. Uh, I became friends with Robert Nalon because my wife Irene was working at the ANZ Bank in Kingsford. And then Robert Nalon told uh, Irene that uh, Larry Scott was in town. So by this time I was playing music in London. So he rang me, she rang me and said, you wouldn't believe who's in town, Larry Scott. I said, how long is he going to be there for? He said, a couple of weeks. So I jumped on the next flight and I came back. Because I idolized him. He's such a small man with a big arm and big belts and, and uh, came back. And then uh, we got into a big fight the night before I came back. My eye was all swollen with, with some of the bikers there in England. Anyway, came back and then I went straight to the gym and let, guess who was training? Arms, Larry. Uh, the preacher bench. And no one was allowed in the gym when he was there. So I came in, Robert said, you know, sit down. And I was watching him and he said, do you train? I said, no, sir. He said, well, first, first of all, don't call me, sir. My name's Larry. <laughs> and he was doing the preacher bench and he was explaining to me how, and, and he said, come, get up, get up. How he angled his, his arm and had a, a quarter moon angle that brought the weight up and down. It wasn't straight up and down. Because he said, you know, your muscle breathes, it needs space to develop. So don't go straight up and down. I said, okay. Anyway, at the end of that, he says, uh, you come, come early tomorrow, we train. <laughs> it was like, you know, like a dream, but it was real, man. It was real. It was real. And then anyway, uh, he ended up guest posing at a show at uh, Miranda in the shop shopping center. And uh, the way they, they designed the lighting, you know, first it was all dark and the spotlight came above him. And his shoulder was like rugby balls, you know, huge, huge, huge. But it wasn't huge. When I stood beside him, it's, it's normal, you know. 
but it's just the way the effect of the light and the way he's he's, he's built beautiful 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 round muscular shoulders and and bicep and whatever yeah i was and, sitting in the audience so i saw that yeah and i was right down the back because my eyes it was all swollen you know right down the back and it was an experience of a lifetime so that kind of kicked it off for me and then we uh and then i continued training at rob's and a contest came up at the opera house i think with the, the one that roy calendar won and then and then I, he said billy why don't you compete but don't tell anybody so there were a couple of guys in the gym that were training for it you know <laughs> That was the Australasia, wasn't it? Yeah, Australasia. And yeah. Roy Callender won the a pro pro am. That's it. Pro oh. pro am or was it pro am, Mister Universe? That he won. That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So you know, hanging out with the calendar on Bondi Beach and sunbaking and winking at all of these young pretty girls and but we had a good time. Yeah, He's a very humble man. Yeah, Roy was a lot of, Roy was fun. Yeah, so. I, I competed in that show and I, I placed higher than the two guys that was in the gym. So Robert said, you know, there could be something here. Well, that was 70, 78, I think, 78, yeah. Yes. And then 79, I did the New South Wales in the novice, 79 novice, New South Wales. I think I won that one against the Tongan guy. And then I went to Melbourne for the Australia uh, and got messed up badly because I was in, in a different category. Anyway, it was all new for me. So I, I, I think I came third in the novice in the Australia. Don Marnie came first and then I, I competed. They allowed me to compete the second category. I was short class, but I went into the medium and in the medium had uh, Peter Lindsay, and Richard Jonker and Ivan Jurlik, all the big boys, all yeah. they were in, in that year. Yeah. I think I, I came fifth that year, 79. Yeah, but, but the guy that came second in the novice, he, he didn't place in the, in the uh, top five. I placed higher than him. So he beat, he beat me in the novice, and then I beat him in the open. You know? It's so, interesting. It, yeah. it was, yeah, and, and, and uh, Burwash was trying to explain it to me, and Peter McCarthy came. He said, no, you have a lot of potential to sort of train hard next year. I said, okay, and I left it. Was it different judges, or was it the same judges? Because that's, you know, that's a unique thing. It's happened before, and it'll happen again, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah, was it the same judges or different judges? Oh, I wasn't really... I was just happy to be there, to, yeah. to take, take part in the national title, yeah. you know? Uh, in the national title in your first year. So I went back home and then uh, trained. And one thing I did that I, I realized that a lot of people weren't doing this. Uh, I trained through through the Christmas holidays. I didn't take a break. Uh, and this is one of the things Dad told me. He said, there's a weak link there out there. you got to find it. If you find it, you know, it's going to help you. And I said, what do you mean weak, weak link? And then anyway, it all worked it out. I said, these guys don't train on Christmas. They all party, you know? And he said, he said, son, that's the one. You train hard, you train hard, you train hard. So I did that in Christmas 79, and then 1980 started again. Then 1980 was a hell of a year for me. Well, wait a minute, let's go back to 1979 when I met you at the Pro-Am Mr. South Pacific. Yeah, you came and helped me out. I was training my car. I was pumping my calves up or something or my legs. We were, or back, we were backstage. Both of us were backstage. Yeah. <laughs> and you were you, you wouldn't stop. And I, I thought, just, I thought, I've seen this before. I've done this. Try yeah. to get this guy to stop himself from burning out. He's not even in the same division as you. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's when I came over and said something. That's when we first met. Okay, you told me not to warm, not to do anything with my legs as well. You said, you know, just take it easy, settle down. I was just happy to be there, bro. Yeah. It's a big bus, you know, coming from Fiji and all that. That was at the Opera House too, eh? No, that one was was at Rockdale, the chuck oh, wagon, and okay. it was a very controversial contest. Yeah, um, they did an article on it in one of the magazines. It was called "Up the Darkened Staircase" because of what happened that day and. 
how they felt that um, Roger Walker was two weeks before the Mr. Olympia where he placed sixth. Yeah. And he won the heavyweight division in the Pro-Am Mr. South Pacific, but uh, Ivan Drillich beat him for the overall. I, I, came, actually, I won the lightweight. You, you won the lightweight. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I was a middleweight, which is now known as the light heavyweight. Yep. And I got third, which, you know, wasn't a great placing, but the, the guys that got first and second were really good bodybuilders. Yeah. And I, I wasn't at my best. That's where we met. Okay. So then 1980, let's go to 1980. 1980, first one was the New South Wales. Yeah. Uh, uh, I won the New South Wales. And then we went to Brisbane for the Australia. So we were already training together. Yeah, at the American Silhouette. We worked there, but we trained at at a gym well, in Bondi on Bondi Road. Remember? Um, yeah, down down you go down. Yeah. On yeah. Bondi Road, yeah. all in uh, Carol Grant's yeah, gym. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's where yeah. all the Mr. Olympia competitors trained. That's right. That's right. Arnold, Arnold was there for the eight year uh, yeah. Olympia and posing in the back with uh, yeah. you know, all the boys. Yeah, no, that was good. It's an experience in a, of a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. And I was very, very fortunate enough to be to be part of that inner circle, including yourself, that uh, we were so close with all these guys. I mean, they are only human like us, but they are on a different level. They're yeah? on a different level. Yeah. They're on a different level. Anyway, did the New South Wales, won the New South Wales, uh, and then went to uh, Brisbane for the Australia, uh, won the Australia, but uh, uh, some people weren't happy. It was a one vote uh, advantage. I thought I got him in my posing, being a musician, you know, uh, had no problem entertaining people on stage. So my posing was, I thought was, was all right to get me across the line. But the funny thing about that is that uh, some people didn't think that I won. I have the trophy here with me, but in the, in the record, it says that someone else won in 1980. It wasn't me, but well, it's hold on, three. Right? Was so that because get, of a different federation or because you No, no, same, won. same federation. Well, same federation. Who, who else won? Because I thought you won. Well, I, I did win, but they didn't, for some, for some reason, they didn't like me or they didn't like the results. So whatever. Okay, but well, I, I, I won't use names, but the guy that I beat for the overall, we ended up going to Manila together for the universe. Remember? And, uh, I competed for Fiji and then you won the best in Australia and yep. then you represented Australia yep. and we all went. So yep. the guy who, that I beat for the overall Australia, he placed higher than me in the mid, in the middleweight. He came down from light heavy to middleweight okay. and he placed in the top three. So yep. they thought that, you know, uh, he should have been the Miss Australia. Okay. Yeah, so I, I had, didn't have any problem with that. So uh, I told Dad, you know, I wasn't very happy. He said, why? And then I explained it to him. And he said, son, that weak link that we discovered, you've got to go back and do the same thing. So basically what I did was I trained through Christmas in 1980. And then 81, I won this Australia, but the guy that they say was better than me didn't show. And I went to the World Games in Santa Clara and I took a silver medal. And that was an, uh, another experience of a lifetime there in the World Games, took a silver medal. And I believe up until today, no other Australian has ever won a medal in bodybuilding at the World Games. I'm not sure how, how that works, but anyway. No, I haven't heard of anyone else. Yeah, so... Uh, so that was 1981. Uh, World Games 1981, yeah. then won, won the second overall Australia. So back to back okay. at uh, 8081. So uh, uh, dad, dad asked me to find out if, you know, how many people before me that won it twice. And I said there were two. And he said, now you can, you can stick it right up. And he said, you trained and do everything like you've done for the last 12 months or 24 months. 
train through Christmas and then prove to them that, you know, that you're better than a lot of people think. So 82, I did my third overall and won third overall against Gary Lua. He was huge, big boy, big back, big arms. Uh, wasn't symmetrical, but but anyway, but Gary, uh, that was a, a national achievement for me beating Gary that day. Was, yes. He went backstage and turned the, turned the tables upside down. You know, the whole so girlfriend crying and mother crying, everybody. <laughs> It's a different experience again. They came in thinking, you know, we're here to win. We don't want to take a second. Anyway, that was in 82. So after winning that, dad said, that's enough, son. I said, what do you mean? He said, give the other people a chance, you know? Now, you know, they got nothing to say. So in that 80, that was 82. Now, so when did you win, you, you won the Mr. International. Uh, oh yeah, that was in uh, that was in uh, in Los Angeles, and Gaspari competed in the show. Gaspari won the the junior, and then I think I won the novice or something. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or came second. In See, Los back Angeles. then, what year was that? Oh, uh, God. Oh, it's just too many too many shows. Eighty three or eighty four. No, no, 83, I was with Bill Pearl for the Naba Universe. Uh, 82, we went to Belgium, but couldn't compete because of the politics of the, the name change and all that. And uh, well, it's just all over the place. See, one thing about me, if I didn't win uh, a major contest, I just kind of forgot about it. You know, I came second a, a, a couple of times in the Australia against Keonti and all that, but I don't count that. Second is not is no good for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, it all accumulated up there and then did the did the South Pacific, won the South Pacific, then I won the couple South Pacific in eighty with uh, uh, Carol Graham, uh, with eighty one was with uh, the other girl, what's her name? The police lady. Gail Laurie. Yeah, Gay Laurie. Uh, and then I did the couples with Beth Lopez, Australia, 81 and, and 82. So all in all, uh, and two, univer uh, two South Pacific. And then um, then we had the politics in, in part of it, where I, I went with uh, Helmut and Gay Laurie, and we formed the uh, UVVA. Because we couldn't, we weren't allowed to use the name of the IFBB Australia. Anyway, so we uh, we did that, and then I came up with the idea where if you win an overall Australia, you shouldn't be allowed to compete back in the Australia. You should allow, you should give the guys a chance to do it. You know. Yeah. So so I didn't compete in 80, 83, the Australia eighty four, eighty five. In '86, they they brought in the new ruling that if you you want to go to the universe, you've got to requalify. So I did the '86 uh, Australia, the South Juniors, and Gary Lua beat me for the overall. In '87, in Adelaide with Sammy, and Sammy looked beautiful. That he, had, you know, good athlete, good shape, very ripped. And uh, he went on to the universe and won his high class. So I won that my high class there, so that made it five. And then I left it at that and didn't compete again. So these were all the that. years when I was in the United States. I had no idea what was going on or what you were doing, to tell you the truth. We... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember you inviting me to go to the States, and then I thought, you know, it's, it's pretty exciting, but. It's a scary experience as well. Yeah. And then we, we talked about some numbers and then it worked out the, that it was very expensive yeah. to, to be there. You know, you had a one bedroom uh, unit with just a small bed and he said, Billy, there's no space for two people. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, when you look back, 
I'm a family man. I like I took my whole family to Australia. I, I, I didn't want to leave them, even though I had another opportunity with Bill Powell, you know, to go and live in, in Medford, Oregon and train. Uh, there was a doctor that was training with us, very wealthy man, very, very wealthy man. He said, Billy, you come bring your wife and your, and your kid. I'll build your house at you know, the end of the five acre sp uh, spread. So I spoke with Bill Pearl and he said, well, if you want to give your life to the church and 10% and of all your earnings to the church, well, that's the key to what they want you to, to be, you know? I said, I can't because, you know, uh, mom and dad in Sydney, and all my family in Sydney, I'm, I'm Fijian, man, I can't do that. Anyway, but so that, that opportunity fell, fell through. That was one. So Billy, what I wanted to ask you is you, you actually won the Mr the junior Mr. South Pacific in 1970. Who inspired you to even get into that contest? Because after that you went into boxing, but what what got you involved in bodybuilding? What was, who was the figure? What caused you to, to even compete in that contest and train for it? At the uni, uh, South your, Pacific. Your very first contest in, in, in Fiji. In Fiji. Yeah. Oh, that's for, that's for rugby, see? No, but you did win, win a bodybuilding contest, didn't you? You won the junior... A junior Mr. Fiji in 1970. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought I had a very, very, very good physique from training the basic uh, exercise for rugby only. It wasn't for bodybuilding. Okay, you just but, went in that contest, but you were actually a rugby player. Yeah, well, my, my rugby uh, career was very short. I had two games and I got sent off twice. Yeah. For sh for shoulder charge, yeah. you know, and I said, "No, nah, this is bullshit. I don't want to get involved in this yeah. thing." So I just continued training. Yeah, I just continued training, and you know, and then people make fun of me. You know, oh, here comes Starzan, or oh, here comes. Uh... So, so who inspired you to even start training? <clears throat> I think it was my uncle. Okay. Yeah, my uncle, Dad's younger brother. Yeah, he, he's he's a senior police officer in the jail and yeah. he had a physique like steve reeves okay yeah and he's he's he told me you know you keep up with this you know it could be something good for you for your future but i said oh yeah i'll just train but the other thing is when you wear clothes and you you've got a nice physique on the beach all the girls look at you bro you know and, and we're at that age you know yeah. high level testosterone and we've got all the girls and and all that but anyway that's so, another story so billy when we were training we used to go through some really heavy loads which i don't think were necessary so in the end what what do you think was the best way to train because some of the stuff that we used to do and you know a lot of it i you know i was still in in the learning stage we, we you know it was overdone like i remember using the amount of weight that we were using on preacher curls with the influence of Larry Scott and everybody else. But I, I noticed later in order, when we stopped training, in order for me to put any additional size on, I actually had to start training lighter, much lighter to feel the movements. How, yeah. how did Bill Pearl influence you? What was my influence? What, what do you feel is the best way to train? I was fortunate enough as uh, the president for Australia that gave me access to most of the top guys that we brought to Australia for seminars and all. I was with them, picked them up on the airport and trained with them. So I was training with all these different people, with Foxy, uh, Brian Buchanan, just to name a few, Bill Pearl, Larry so Scott. Yeah, but what, what I experienced was I was taking bits and pieces of different people, you know, and, and the way that they approached me when they saw, saw me doing something, they will say, uh, oh, you must be new in town. I said, yeah, yeah, what's your name, Billy Knight? Where are you from, Fiji? Where's Fiji? Oh, it's in near Hawaii, you know? And they said, Billy, why don't you try it this way? Reduce your weight and just try it this way and see what happens. It's very humbling the way they try to explain it to you, you know, 
And I worked it out that in all the training I've done up until that point, 80% of the angles that I was using, it wasn't correct. So I practice on those angles. You know, I call it quarter moon angle, a bit like what Larry said, you know, you bring the weight in and instead of just straight up and down and the shoulders, you know, if you're doing military press, you don't push it straight up and down behind the, uh, uh, on, on the top of your, your ears, you push it backwards, you push it behind your ears. He said, because when you're on stage and you do a double bicep, you will feel it when you push your, your weight behind, it, it all comes together and then you spread, put your legs down. So it's, it's a two, two phase uh, movement for one pose. And when you do your front, it's an angle this way because it's a tie in of your front delts with your, your side pack. So you've got three different angles when you're doing a military press, as an example. You go straight up and down, or back, or front. So then what I do is I rotate it. If I do this one workout, a few days later, I do it the other way, another workout, and another way. Yeah. So for the other example with, uh, with uh, Tom Fletch, when I stayed with him for two weeks, he helped me for the World Games because I helped him for the Olympia with uh, with uh, Casey Vieto. Here in Sydney, yeah? For the yeah, 1980. yeah, 1980. Anyway, his, his leg training was different to Jeff King, and Jeff King had big legs as well. And, you know, one of the things that I learned from those guys is on the military press machine, they put their, their legs like this. And then they angle it out. It's a very awkward position, but after a while you get used to it and then you start to get heavy, you know? Yeah. So again, there's little things. Uh, so these Brian are all the things that you never read in magazines. Nobody no, no, about. no, no. They don't teach you in any courses. No. Unless you've had the experience, there's no way of knowing all these little things because they just don't get spoken of. No, no, my brother. No. And, and see today, if, I've always been like this, you know. Uh, if I see somebody not doing it properly, I can help them. But when they look at me, they think that I'm trying to draw them to, for, a, uh, for a personal training program, you know. And it's hard because I understand where they're coming from. So now I just don't say anything or do anything anymore because people will tell my son, Corey, I know your dad. And then when we see him in the gym, he said, said Dad, does a guy say he knows you? I said, son, everybody knows me, son. But, you know, I've learned from a very early age uh, that it's important to remember the people that are important to you than try to remember everything and everybody, you know? They're different again. This focus. You see, I worked for Superstar Australia as I did an endorsement for them. And the guy who owned it is Ron Marks. He's the five-time world champion, barefoot ski champion. <laughs> and and uh, we had the head office in Parramatta. I lived in Pagewood. And then one, one meeting we were called. He said, how are you, Billy? Good, good, sir. Uh, how is the family? Good, good. Uh, what did you see when you came here today? I said, what do you mean? What did you see when you came here today? I said, here's a trick question, see? I said, oh, you see the cars and the buses and people and the shops? And he said, no, what did you see? I said, what do you, what, what do you mean? He said, you should learn to focus and look at things, but don't see what's not important to you. I said, say it, say it again. He said, when you're in the gym training and a beautiful girl come in front of you and then she bends over, and you're training, you look at it, but don't see it because you're not there for it. you got to focus on what you're there for. And I said, uh, <laughs> it seemed funny to me at the time. And he said, why do you think we bought you three sets of different colors of tracksuits? Why do you think we bought you three sets of clothes when you're going to do in-store promotions with the Westfield shopping centers? 
So when you're in the gym training and you're wearing red, everything is on your body is red. So when you look in the mirror, you see yourself, you feel, you feel comfortable, you smell good, you know. Now, if you want to sneak in to see the girl behind you, you don't look at her. You, you look at the reflection of the girl behind you through the mirror in front of you. And be very selective on what you want to see that's important to you. To satisfy your need and whatever, whatever. So, you know, and in, in meeting everybody, everybody's my blood. How are you, my brother? How are you, blood? You know, but the, the important one is I'll remember, I'll try and remember their names, you know? Yeah, and that's hard. Billy, uh, m moving along, we briefly spoke about training and you, you described pretty much how you do things which are different. Uh, I remember once we also went and saw Lincoln Webb, both of us went and saw Lincoln and he was very helpful yep. with, with a lot of stuff. Yep, yep. Um, he, he was also you know, somebody who was quite influential and hopefully somewhere along the line I'll interview him as well. What yep. I did want to also ask you was diet. Because you, you know how important that was. And with you, was there any particular information that you can give us? Because I remember even when you were competing, your peaking procedure and how you used to feel when you were peaking. You know, you would come to me and go, boy, this, this peaking procedure is something else. I mean, during the year, like when we were training, we were always talking about diet leading up to a contest like in the off season we ate a lot of good food i don't remember how many meals you were having for me it was always between three to five meals most yeah. of the time three how how were you doing it because even though we spoke a lot about it <clears throat> i actually don't know exactly what you were doing I, I remember once we were at the beach and it was before that contest in manila and I started questioning you and I said, what, why are you eating this way? And you said, oh, well, look, today it's hot and this is all I can take. You know, so tell us more about the diet and how it used to work for you. I, for one, I felt that the, the diet nutrition part of my, of my prepping was my weak link. You see, I didn't, back then you were writing down calories. You knew exactly, you were spot on. And you were trying to explain it to me. And I, I, I'm a Fijian. To everything you tell me, I'll say yes. But it's, it's really not yes. Yeah. You know, I was still experimenting, to, reaching out to try and find the best way. But I took it from the mirror. Whatever I was doing back then looked good to me on the mirror and good to, to some people that I can uh, relate to that were constructive in the criticism of my physique. I try to stay away from the people who say, Billy, you look great, when I didn't look great, you know? Uh, but again, for the nutrition, just common sense, bro. Just common sense. And uh, there's no really secret, there's no pattern. You know, now people prep for 20 weeks, for 16 weeks and, and all sorts of shit. Uh, but they get in better shape because the supplementation now is more superior than what it was before. You know, I didn't have money to buy all the supplements. I didn't take the supplements. I didn't take the protein. You see? Uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm in a position uh, to talk about nutrition or what I ate back then because I don't even remember, bro. I don't remember. Whatever I was doing back then looked good in the mirror that made me win. And I recall, I recall, I think it was Bill Pearl. He said, Billy, if you are winning now, why you want to get any bigger than, than what you are? Why you want to experiment on new things that might affect the shape that you get in? You know, are you winning the contest you go in? I said, yes. Yeah, and if you take second sometimes, yeah, I say yes, but I turn away from the second because I don't like to take second. And he said, well, if that means you go harder on the first. But the other thing too is it's all year round. I didn't blow up to 100 kilos and then came down to 80. You know? 
I st stuck around around 81, 82. But back then I was seven. My first Australia, I was 73 kilos, bro. My second Australia, I was 77 kilos. My third Australia was 79 and a half kilos. I was small, man. I was small and light. And, but my, I thought my posing, the angles that I used and the, and the poses that I selected uh, complemented my physique, and, you know? And when I, when I stood beside the bigger guys, my symmetry and balance got me across the line. And, and, and little things, you know, like warming <laughs> up and, and all sorts of stuff like that. I mean, something Frank Zane taught me. He said, in bodybuilding, there's three rounds. When you come out in the first round, come out at 80%. Then come out in the second round, 90%. When you come out for the final round, you'll be 100%. If you come out in, on the third round with 100%, then you go 90% in the second round. By the time you, you, you uh, reach the main uh, round, you'll be flattened. You'll flatten out to 80%. And that's why he doesn't warm up backstage. Again, you know, I he had that opportunity. He doesn't pump up. He doesn't pump up, bro. And in the other corner, Casey said, Billy, bring that weight, bring that bigger weight. And he's pumping up. And a different to Sergio Oliveira. Sergio Oliva, when he came here, I was the only one allowed in his warm-up room downstairs. And he didn't do very much at all, man. Didn't do very much at all, but he just did a lot of stretching, you know? Because that, that show when Beth Francis posed as well. So you're, Sergio, saying, you're saying Sergio did not pump up a lot backstage? Well, he he didn't need to because he came out, he did three poses and walked back, walked behind the stage and everybody went, boo! <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It wasn't a full routine, bro. And then and I wondered, why? You know, you, you pay all this money to come and see him, but he's come all this way. You know, why don't he just do a good routine? You know, he's warmed up. It, and then I thought, oh, maybe that's why he didn't warm up. He warmed up, but he didn't warm up. You yeah. know what I'm saying? How do you explain that? A bit like Zane. Zane is standing around and, and you know, still got his tracksuit. Everyone is oiling down. Zane's just standing in the corner. But when he takes his tracksuit off or his clothes off and he starts to fill out on that, you know, on the principle of 80, 90, 100, might he's just as bigger than them, but beautiful, beautiful, beautiful physique, Zane. And, and anybody you would like to thank in closing? I want to thank everybody that has anything to do with me living today. That's perfect. Thank you, my brother, Billy. It's been oh. such a pleasure. Um, you know, we haven't seen each other for a while. The last time you attempted to come down, you couldn't. Um, and, you know, hope, hopefully, um, We'll see each other sometime soon, face to face. Yeah, I, I always look forward, as you know. Whenever I come to Sydney, I try and make an effort to just come and see you, have a coffee, or just and you've, say you've hi. offered me to come and stay with you in Brisbane as well. You've very mm. kindly offered me that, and I've not been able to do that. So um, I'm not sure when we'll next meet face to face, but um, it, it will be great when we do, and I hope it's sometime soon. This video is brought to you by JohnTorelli.com, the place to go to get in shape and stay that way. There's a free trial available with no credit card required. JohnTorelli.com